All right, like we talked about before, focus, exposure, and white balance are really important for each individual shot. Next up we're gonna be talking about is photo styles. And photo styles are really important, but it's one of those things that you pretty much set once, unless you wanna play around with a certain look of, in the camera. And this is very subjective. I mean, you can go a lot of different ways. We're gonna be talking about contrast, saturation, hue, um, all the different picture styles include Cine Like D. This is very personal. It's how you want it to look. But what I'd be talking about is giving yourself options. So you can shoot it one way, very generically or flat. And then later on, you can basically spice it up or add your flavor to it in the post editing process. Um, gives you a lot of options. If that's not the way you want to go and you want to add, let's say, more contrast and you want to get the picture in camera right first, which is always a good thing, you can definitely do it that way. So what we're going to do is we're going to start out with contrast before we even talk about picture styles because I think contrast is a great way to get started with this subject. All right, we're going to step through all the different contrast settings. This is minus five on the natural picture style. And then we're going to go to minus four and we'll step to minus three. And what you're looking for is you can see there's a difference between like in the, the shade is getting darker, the grass is getting brighter, like the highlights are becoming brighter as we stretch the image out. Basically, we're adding more contrast. What's interesting about this is we're not adding any saturation because usually when you increase contrast, you add saturation, but the camera is not doing it. It's keeping it equal. I've looked at the vector scope. It's not adding any contrast or saturation. So to compare, let's go back to minus five. And this is the way I normally shoot. Um, which gives us a lot of options in post and then go back to plus five You can see that there's a huge difference between minus five and plus five So what I want to do now is let's go back and let's go into speed grade and I'm going to take this clip that I was shot at um, Negative five and I'm going to match the shot that was shot at plus five So I'm adding contrast back in you can see on the contrast slider, I've pushed it all the way up to 0.68. And now I'm gonna change the pivot point so it matches the other shot. And then since we had um, saturation was added, I actually have to decrease the saturation here down quite a bit. And then at this point, the two shots should match pretty evenly. And as you can see, we cursor back and forth between plus five and minus five. You can see they look pretty similar now. Um, not maybe exactly the same, but they're very similar. But the point I'm trying to make here is I can add contrast later, but what I can't do is take away contrast later in post. So if you want to give yourself a lot of different options, definitely shoot at minus five contrast. It'll give you the most options in terms of adding contrast later. Here I am shooting a 41 step chart. And at the top of the picture here, you can see that I've got a waveform monitor. And as I step through all the contrast settings, you can see in the lower right hand corner we're at plus three, plus two. That S curve that we started out with, which is very contrasty, becomes less contrasty. And here's zero, plus, minus one, minus two, becomes even flatter. It's becoming a very nice straight line without any curve in it. Until we get all the way to a negative five. You can see it's very um, straight. And it's originally when I thought about a negative five, I was thinking it was kind of like an inverted S curve, but it's not. It's actually probably what's coming off the sensor. And I think they probably should label this differently. It should probably be minus five should probably be zero, whereas plus five should be like 10, you know, in terms of the way the contrast is set up. Because I think actually minus five is what's actually coming off the sensor. So again, this I think graphically shows you what's going on with the contrast. So if you add a lot of contrast, it's hard or if not impossible to get rid of that contrast later because if, as soon as you like crush the blacks all the way down to zero, well, that information at zero is lost. You can't like bring it up to like plus 10 or 20 IRE, you can't stretch it out if there's no detail left in it. Same thing with the highlights. If they're at blown out at over 100, well, you're not gonna recover those highlights because you shot with a really contrasty um, contrast setting. All right, next up, we're gonna step through all the profiles in the order of contrast. So this one has the most contrast, Cine Like B, at its default zero contrast setting. So we got Vivid, we go to Scenery, Standard, black and white, 
You can see we're getting less and less contrast portrait. And then actually natural here, I actually shot this at a minus five, so it's not actually fair. But then the last one is Cine Like D at its default zero contrast setting. And just for kicks, I threw in the iPhone. This is from my iPhone. Um, just to get a, an idea of what it's shooting like. So we're gonna see what it looks like on the graph. Here's Cine Like V, and I'm gonna run through this three times. I want you to watch the graph first. Just look at the top graph. Here's Vivid, Scenery, Standard, Black and White, Portrait, Natural, and Cine Like D. So I'm gonna play that again for you. But now I want you to look at the right side of the 41 step chart and watch what's happening to the highlights only. There's standard, black and white, portrait, natural, and cine like D. And let's play it one more time. Now look at the blacks, like down around the 29 to 27 range of that 41 step chart and watch what's happening as the contrast um, becomes lessened. Here's natural and the last one is Cine Like D. So what you'll notice is Cine Like D has a very different curve compared to the other photo styles. It has kind of this mid-tone dip, especially around where the flesh tones are, and it basically decreases the contrast for the flesh tones, which is, is if that's something you're going for, that might be a picture style uh, worth using, but it requires editing. So basically, in the manual it says Cine, D, Cine Like D gives priority to the dynamic range using a gamma curve. The gamma curve is suited for editing. Now, I don't want you to confuse this gamma curve to a logarithmic curve, because this is not a logarithmic curve that you'd find like with Sony's S-Log or Canon's C-Log. Um, this, is, this is different. This is a curve I've never really even seen before. So basically, with that mid-tone dip that decreases contrast in the mid-tones, you're gonna need to edit this. You're gonna basically need to bring back mid-tone contrast in your post-processing um, setup. Sorry, I've got kind of a bit of a cold if I sound a little bit different today. So if we look at this graph, the difference between natural and Cine Like D, you can see that kind of mid-tone dip what's going on there. And what's interesting is the manual talked about it being having this kind of um, dynamic range benefit, but what I'm seeing is it actually has less of a benefit, especially in the, the high end. When you look at the highlights, the way it's got this kind of inverted curve and then it clips. I would almost have a, like to have a linear curve and then clip. The better, the better way to have it would be a logarithmic curve where it has this nice soft knee and then it clips. But this is actually kind of opposite. Where it does increase the dynamic range is when you look at the low end, down around the, where it's going between 29 to 24 on that 20, 41 step graph, you could see there basically it's boosting the shadows slightly. So that's kind of a little bit of a benefit, but the amount of work, and I'm gonna demonstrate this here in a bit, the amount of work it takes to correct the Cine Like D when you have flesh tones in the image is very difficult. All right, next up I wanna compare natural against Cine Like D. And Cine Like D has this, like we've talked about, this weird um, gamma curve in the mid-tones. And here these two are already graded. I'm showing you uh, Cine Like D right here. But let's go to the ungraded. Here's the natural picture style. And here is the Cine Like D. And you can see what's going on in those uh, mid-tones in her skin. It's kind of creating this uncontrasty part. Here's a low key situation. Uh, again, these are both at negative five contrast. This is the graded version of natural. And here's the graded version of Cine Like D. I think I matched these pretty well together. Um, here's natural. I actually white balanced the tungsten, um, but those actually came out a little bit warmer than I thought. And here's the ungraded of Cine Like D. And again, you can really see what's going on in the skin tones because it's got that inverted curve. Here is a mixed lighting situation where I've got tungsten on her left cheek and uh, blue light or daylight on her right cheek. And here's the graded version of Cine Like D. It's a very hard thing to grade because which one do you grade it for, the daylight or the tungsten? Here is the ungraded version of natural the graded version of Cine Like D. 
Next up, we have natural. This is the graded version. And here is the graded version of Cine Like D. Still, I didn't think I got the mid-tone contrast just about right on that one. And here it is, ungraded natural. And here is the ungraded Cine Like D. And you can really see what's going on those skin tones. Now what I want you to watch here next, I'm going to play it again, watch it again, but this time look at the out the window and not her face. And look at the highlights between natural and Cine Like D. And you'll notice in the ungraded version, you'll notice as I go back and forth between these two, that natural actually retains more highlights than Cine Like D does. Pretty much the only advantage Cine Like D has is in the, in terms of dynamic range, is usually in the lower end uh, in the shadows. And again, you can use the shadow and highlight um, curves and just bring up the shadows just a little bit more to kind of emulate what's going on with Cine Like D uh, to increase dynamic range. So this is an 8-bit camera and when you're shooting with an 8-bit camera to the SD card um, you basically have 256 shades to play around with and as you bring it into your post-processing you can only push it around so much. You don't want to create too flat of an image or decrease contrast too much like in the midtones like we're doing with Cine Like D when you have an 8-bit codec. Now when you have a 10-bit and this thing will re record 10-bit out of the HDMI to like an Atomish Shogun in 4K which is pretty amazing. The product actually hasn't been released yet and should be released any minute now. But that um, you might use Cine Like D if that's something you wanted to try um, because if you add contrast in a very uncontrasty image um, basically what happens is you can run into banding issues and if you run into banding issues especially with somebody's face um, then you're in a world of hurt because then it can get really nasty in terms of what's going on in the skin tones and you definitely don't want to do that so I would say I almost say stay away from Cine Like D because I don't see any benefit, especially in the high end where the roll off of the knee of the the, the brightest areas of the image, because it's not again a logarithmic gamma curve. It's just a kind of an odd gamma curve that basically slightly lifts the shadows slightly. But you could do that with the shadow curve that we've talked about before. You could bump it up, and that's one of the reasons why I use natural and I bump up the shadows just like a plus one, as we talked about before. So again, Cine Like D, um, you're going to require you to do editing and post. If you want a quick turnaround, just stick with natural and you'll get there much faster. So I think it would be beneficial for you guys to see a lot of different photo styles and different lighting situations. So here's an evening shot. So we'll start off with this and it's this is the first one is Cine Like V, which has again the most contrast and the, the contrast is set at zero. And here's Vivid, again, contrast set at zero. And again, we're just going to kind of run through these. Um, I think it's kind of beneficial to for you guys to know and if there's a certain look that you want to have in camera. Um, you might try Standard or Vivid or Scenery if that works for you. But again, if it's one of those things where you have a little bit of time and you can just add contrast later in post, then I would definitely do it. And here's Cine Like D. And remember, Cine Like D has about a third of a stop darker image than anything else. All right, this is Cine Like D. And look at the clouds and the trees, those dark trees for each one. Here's standard. Here's natural at negative five contrast. And here's Cine Like D with contrast at a negative five. Here's Cine Like V. Here's another evening shot where the sun was setting. Vivid scenery standard black and white portrait and here's cine like d all right here's cine like d and this is a cloudy uh, environment here's vivid scenery standard black and white Portrait, Natural, and Cine Like D. All right, next up we're going to talk about sharpness. And like we've talked about before, the GH4 is a very sharp camera, especially in 4K. you got lots of great detail. Um, my recommendation would be to turn it all the way down sharpness and do your sharpening and post if you need to. So let's go ahead and step through a scenery shot. So here's minus 5 in terms of the sharpness. 
minus four, minus three. So as we step through here, minus two, it's going to become more and more sharp. Minus one, zero. I would recommend never going above zero. Plus one, plus two. And for a landscape shot like this, you know, having a lot of sharpness is a good thing. And I would advise you to turn it all the way down in camera, but add the sharpening in post. It's quite easy with things like Speed Grade or Premiere Pro. So next up, I want to show you why you want to turn it all the way down, especially if you're doing, let's say, like an interview with somebody's hair and especially like, you know, with blemishes, because, you know, I've got sunspots and things as I've aged and what happens is you add more sharpness, it gets crispier and your skin becomes those blemishes and stuff really start to stand out. So again, it's one of those things you want to turn all the way down. So let's take a look at some hair. So here's my daughter's hair with the sharpness at plus, actually at zero. This is the zero setting um, on the GH4. And as you can see, it kind of shimmers and shakes and has this kind of aliasing type of thing going on which is just very distracting. And here's with the sharpness turned all the way down. Now you're gonna say, well, Dave, it looks a little bit dull, but we're not seeing that shimmering and shaking and stuff like that. So what we can do is we can actually add sharpness to that easily, because the sharpening that's going on in this little tiny processor is a lot different than the algorithm that goes on in your computer. This computer's algorithm is probably a lot better than it is with here. And it gives you an option to sharpen it later. Most of the times you don't want to sharpen too much of anything in the GH4 because we already have so much detail, which is, which is a great thing. But again, I would advise taking that sharpness and putting it all the way down to negative five. All right, next up, we're going to talk about saturation. Here we are at negative five saturation. We're going to step through all of the different saturation values. And here we go to negative four. As we step up, you're going to see that the, the trees are going to get greener, the sky is going to get bluer, the grass is going to get, I don't know, more amber because it's all dried out in the summertime uh, in Colorado. And here we are at a negative one. And as we move up, basically, I usually leave it at negative one. Um, the reason is, is mostly because of exposure. Because if you have, like, say, somebody's skin in the, the image, and let's say have that oily skin, and that red channel, if you've oversaturated it too much, like at a plus three or plus five, well, that's going to clip out before anything else because there's a lot of like skin in the image and it's it's clipping out. But if you're at like let's say a negative one, you're retaining all that um, basically color information. Um, it's still there. I'm not like at a negative flyover. I'm not like a black and white or anything where I don't have any color information. And we want to, I don't want to pull it down all the way. My philosophy is, you know, we've only got a 420 type of recording going on with this camera. And I don't want to lose as much, all that color information. So basically, negative one on the saturation um, just helps a little bit in terms of exposure, especially when you get in situations where somebody has like a red shirt on or like I said, skin tones, you know, the red channel might blow out first because you've got like a specular highlight on somebody's forehead. Um, I would just kick it down. If you want to, you can, you know, especially for a landscape scene like this, I like the way it looks at plus five. I think that looks great. I would be adding saturation and contrast back into this image to make it pop a little bit more like this. But I would say just on the safe side, if you've got time and post and it's a real quick slider adjustment for saturation, you just bring it up to taste and you're done. And so it's very easy to do. So next up, we're going to talk about noise reduction, which is in the picture style, picture profile menu. Um, here we are at a negative four, and as we increase the number, negative three, we're adding, or the camera is adding more noise reduction on the fly to the image. So what I want to do, we're going to do this two different ways. We're going to show you the full entire frame, and then I'm going to show you it really close in. And I kind of picked this background and didn't light the background because usually where you see noise and macro blocking is in the shadows. So especially with compression artifacts. So here's plus five and then here we're going to go zoom all the way in and look at my cheek and my neck and see what's going on here in terms of how the macro blocking is starting to appear as we increase the noise reduction in camera. And you might be seeing a little bit differently than I am because what you're seeing has been retranscoded by Vimeo and there's added more compression. So those macro blocks actually might be more exaggerated for you guys, what you're seeing versus what I'm seeing. So here we are at plus three. 
And here's plus four and plus five. And then just for kicks, we're gonna go all the way back to minus five. And you can see there's quite a bit of difference between plus five, which has more of a blurrier effect, and the minus five, which shows more detail. Um, to be honest, I kind of like the way the minus five light looks with so not having the camera do any noise reduction. So I would advise turn it down. Um, if you've got a well-lit scene, um, I mean, you could leave it at zero. You're not going to notice that much of a difference. Like I know, the reason I showed this to you two different ways is when you were watching it with the full frame, it is really hard to tell. But when you watched it close up, you could see what's going on. So if you want to be aggressive about it, you could go to minus five, but you really don't have to. I would say minus two, minus three would work just fine. All right, the last adjustment that we have in our photo styles is the hue adjustment. So let me show you what it looks like in the zero default setting. And here I am back down in my studio and just basically look at the skin tones and how they're represented. So now what I do is go to the minus five. The minus five basically shifts it to yellow and green. So what you're seeing here is more of a yellow and green tint to my skin. And then if we shift it all the way to the opposite direction plus five, it shifts more to violet and magenta. So uh, this is something that I don't really use that often. Um, maybe if I'm having a problem with somebody's skin tone, first off, make sure your white balance is spot on. And then the skin tones should represent or render really well. That color should come across really well. You could bump up the saturation and see it a little bit better on the screen so you can see what you're doing. Um, I would almost advise not playing around with it unless you really know what you're doing because um, you might because the screen in terms of it's so small seeing colors is sometimes hard and difficult even when you have like a like a seven inch monitor which you might not be able to see here it's a little bit difficult and, and until you get it on a large screen um, colors you'd be able to see what's going on in terms of colors a lot better so I would advise get your white balance right first before you make any sort of adjustment here all right, I think this is a good point to kind of recap really quickly what we've got in terms of settings on the camera. So starting out with the photo style, I've chose natural. I've got the contrast turned all the way down, sharpness turned all the way down, noise reduction turned all the way down, saturation down one. Like I talked about before, this is mostly an exposure issue. I just don't want to blow out a certain channel. The hue I leave at default. And we can back out of here and we work our way down. We've got shadow and highlights. Remember, I boosted the shadows because um, I'd like to have a little bit more information in the shadows. I don't want to go too aggressive with this because if I increase it too much, um, if I increase this one too much, you'll get a lot of noise going on in the shadows. And I've noticed plus one works pretty darn well. Um, if we move our way down, high dynamic, definitely turn that one off because like, like I've demonstrated before, you can really get some nasty effects, especially in lower light. Eye resolution, again, this camera is really um, <laughs> really detailed already, so I would definitely remember, turn that off. Master pedestal, I know there's some people out there that like to increase this, um, but again, what, that, what this does is basically lifts the whole entire thing, whereas the curve adjustment like we showed before, the highlight and shadow, keeps that low point anchored at zero and basically creates this inverted curve to increase the shadows, whereas this, it's lifting all the blacks up, which, again, you can really get into noise situations quite quickly. Um, if you know what you're doing and it looks good on the shot, yeah, go ahead and increase it, but for me, I leave it at zero. Luminance level, zero to 255, and that's pretty much it for right here. So I love to watch other people's videos online and Vimeo and YouTube, and a lot of people share their settings for the GH4, and I've looked about, like, just about all of them. And there's usually a common thread of what people do. There's some, definitely some differences out there where people use the like the shadow and highlight curves or they use the um, master pedestal differently. Um, one common thing appears is either people are using the natural picture style or cine like D. Um, pretty much everybody's using a contrast of negative five. Um, a lot of people are, are using sharpness at negative five. Um, a lot of people are putting their saturation at a minus two, minus three. Like I said, I put mine at a minus one. Um, some people don't touch noise reduction at all. 
Um, highlights and shadows, again, this is all over the place. A lot of people create kind of funky curves. Um, but again, you, once you do that, just watch out for noise. Uh, master pedestal, I have seen some people that boost their mas master pedestal all the way up to plus 15, and they don't touch the shadow and highlight curves at all. Eye dynamic, for the most part, a lot of people that I've read and looked at um, have left it off. Um, pretty much everybody's got the luminance level of 0 to 255. And in terms of, like, like I said before, the pedestal, some people will crank it all the way up to plus 15 and not do anything with the shadow and highlights. So that's pretty much it for the photo style chapter. I think this is one thing, you know, it depends on what you do, but um, I would almost set it that way and just let it run and you get used to that setting. And if you're in a situation where you've got time and you can bounce around the different uh, photo styles and if there's a certain scenery or landscape I mean, situation and you're like, oh, that one just looks a little bit better, I'm going to use that one, definitely go for it. But I think as your main you know, profile, what you use, I think this is a great start um, and you can definitely deviate from my settings. All right, next up, we're going to talk about white balance. Our eye uh, does this on the fly. It knows exactly what white is. Um, it doesn't matter what the environment is. If you look at something over there, look at over there. It might be a mixed lighting. doesn't matter. Your eye can tell what white is. Your brain just does it for you on the fly. Camera on their hand is dumb, doesn't know. Even though we have automatic white balance, which is right here, um, automatic white balance does a pretty good job, especially in outdoor situation. But when you get into mixed lighting, it gets kind of freaked out and like, I don't know what to do for you here, but uh, it's going to pick something. Um, the first one right off the bat, like white, automatic white balance, I would say don't use it. Um, and the, a great example is this environment that I'm shooting in right here. And I've done this many times where I've left it on auto white balance by accident. And if you look out, actually you can see out here, um, you'll notice that there's clouds in the sky. So what happens is if I leave the camera on automatic white balance when I'm filming with and I've got these two fluorescent um, soft boxes here, basically what happens is as the sun goes in and out of those clouds, um, the amount of fill light that's in this room changes and the white balance also changes as well. And it's a, just an utter nightmare, especially if you're like cutting between uh, Let's see, you started recording and then like 10 minutes later you ended the recording but maybe the clouds came in and out. As you're cutting and condensing maybe that cut, whatever you're doing in the edit, um, and you're having those clips back to back, you're going to notice a big jump. One shot might be perfectly correct, then it goes blue or it goes warm and it's just a pain in the butt <laughs> to go in and correct it later. The first one I would say automatic white balance is if you can't, if you've got the time, go ahead and try to pick one of these. Like if it's sunny, you know, pick sunny. If it's cloudy out, if you're in the shade, pick this one. If you're under tungsten lighting, pick this one, um, the tungsten symbol. And then these last four, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you how to do um, custom white balance, which is a very powerful tool. And then if you have even just a little bit more time and you want to adjust it yourself, like right now you can see I am at 7,000 Kelvin, I can bring that down to let's say 5,500 if you think that looks better. Or as you can see, I can go all the way down towards these candles. The candles are low, below 2,000 Kelvin. I believe they're like 1,600 or so. And things can get really blue, but if you're shooting a candle, um, it'll look correct. And if we bring it back up, let's go back up to about 5,500. It's usually about where daylight sits. All right, since we're shooting movies with the GH4 and we're not shooting stills, um, again, movies are very similar to JPEGs. They're all that color information, the what you're telling the camera what is white in terms of the white balance, that information is baked into the movie file. And it's not like a raw image file coming out of here for stills where you can change it quite easily. You can still change the white balance later in post, but it's not as easy and as flexible as changing it with a raw image file. So like I said before, white balance probably takes the most amount of time in terms of setting it. Because if you think of it this way, uh, exposure, if I were to turn the lights off, my brain would instantly know, hey, it just got darker in here. Or if somebody hit me on the side of the head and all of a sudden I was starting to see blurry, things were out of focus, um, I would see that pretty quickly as well. But colors, like I said before, your brain is automatically doing this on the fly, telling us what's white or what's neutral gray. Um, it knows instantly. So what I want to try to do is get you in a situation where you can start thinking differently 
and understanding what the colors that are around you, the light sources, and, and how to adjust your camera for it. So let's start off with automatic white balance. Like I said before, I'd stay away from it. The only time I'd really use it, if you're in a run gun in a situation where you just don't have time and it's outside, um, lots of sunlight, I would say you can use it and it'll probably work just fine. I've, I've done it myself, I've left it on there, and it usually does a very good job. Um, if you are outdoors and you've got time, switch it over to this uh, sun symbol, which is stands for daylight. Then if we move on to cloudy, and if we look at the, the manual again, you'll notice that cloudy actually creates kind of a range, which makes it a little bit confusing actually what it is actually doing. But you can see number three says cloudy sky rain. So you got pretty dark clouds that are um, creating this more bluish light. So it's actually trying to warm the image up to get the colors to be a little bit more accurate. But as you can see in the manual here, it doesn't really explain why, but it kind of shows it a range between being 6,500 to a little over 8,000 Kelvin. And moving on, we have shade. And then if we look over here to our um, manual, it's number four coming in around 7,200 Kelvin. Next up we have tungsten, and as you can see, it turned very blue on the screen. And the reason to turn blue is if you look at our chart here, the light bulb next to number seven says incandescent light bulb. And that it says here it's around 2,800 Kelvin. Most of the time when I ever think of tungsten bulbs or uh, incandescent bulbs, I think of bulbs that are around 3,200. So it's kind of interesting they're showing it at around 2,800 here. So you might be wondering why when we go to tungsten it makes the, the screen look so blue compared to let's say shade. And the reason is is because or a reason I understand it, actually I was at the Smithsonian last weekend in DC and I got to see one of the very first light bulbs um, that Thomas Edison made. Uh, basically what happened from what I understand is you'll notice like on this chart number nine the candle is at around 1600 Kelvin and when they want to design the light bulbs um, he didn't want to like create something that was really blue he wanted to match the candles because that's all they had back then were candles um, to light the homes at night so when he brought in a light bulb he wanted to match the candle as much as possible well it wasn't well, actually one of the of the very first bulbs I think were carbon or something like that, but perhaps actually did um, a lower Kelvin number. But um, I believe most of the tungsten lights that are out there, the screw in that are actually kind of going away that are hard to buy anymore because states are outlawing them and they want you to use the fluorescence or LED bulbs because they're a lot more energy efficient. But the tungsten bulbs basically, um, for the most part in today's world are around 3200 Kelvin. So if you don't have a lot of time, these four presets, sunny, cloudy, shade, and tungsten work fantastic. Um, getting there, getting you there close quickly, really fast. Um, I would say probably the two that you're gonna use the most out of the two presets, or the ones I use the most, are tungsten and this sunny, or daylight. Now if you want to actually adjust and fine tune from here, you can hit the downward arrow cursor and you'll go into the adjust screen. So if you want to subtract the color, let's say it looks a little bit too warm, then you could say, well, if it looks a little too warm, I'm just gonna push it a little bit towards blue and that'll subtract some of that amber color out of there and it'll make it more neutral. All right, next up, we're actually gonna skip over these four custom presets. We're gonna go right to Kelvin. We'll come back to those here in a minute. So I want you to use your up arrow cursor this time and we'll get to this nice graph. And let's go all the way up and let's go all the way up to 10,000. So you can see the image is getting very warm. And as we're going down, we'll stop at each one. Here is shade coming around 7,500. Cloudy's coming around at 6,500. Um, daylight is coming around 5,500. Tungsten is coming in around 3200 and candles is around 1600 so we can't even get to it. And if we look at this graph over here, you'll notice that number one says auto white burn balance works in this range and number one goes from 8000 Kelvin down to 3200. As you'll notice here, we've got a much bigger range. We're going from 10,000 all the way down to 2500. So we have more flexibility. Um, where we were setting the presets, we could do those really fast, back and forth, bounce around, and find the one we want in terms of the presets, like daylight or tungsten. Um, this takes a little bit more time, a little more time consuming, and this is where kind of things slow down a little bit, um, but you can fine tune it a lot more here. So what we're gonna do here <clears throat> is, let's say if I were to, I don't know, let's bring this up to around 4,000. 
a lot of situations you'll be in, you'll be like, you'll look at the scene with your eyes, and then you look down at the screen, and then you, you do kind of this type of thing, and you look down the screen, you say, you know, the screen looks a little bit too blue. So I'm gonna push that up to like 5,000. And then you're gonna look up and look down, look up, look down, and you're like, yeah, maybe it still looks a little bit cooler. So you, then you bring it up to like 5,500, which is daylight. I'm just using it as an example because that happens to me a lot. I look at the scene, I look down, because what I'm trying to do is get the most accurate colors. Now, when it comes to white balance, like I've said before with other things, there's really no right or wrong white balance. You can set it wherever you like. So if if you have a romantic scene, let's say, and you want to push it, things a little bit warm, you can do so. Um, if that's the end result and that's how you want your audience to feel. If on the other hand, it's like maybe a scary scene and you want things to have more of a blue, colder look to it, um, definitely can push it. I would advise you guys to, you know, if you're just getting started, um, and I am no advanced colorist, I would say definitely to um, try to get them as accurate as you can. Because um, if you push things too blue, for instance, and you try to warm them up in post, sometimes you just can't, it's really hard to get there if you've gone too far in one extreme and you wanted to correct it to be more um, neutral. Um, it's, it becomes very difficult if you push it too far one direction or the other. So I'd advise you to try to nail the white balance as much as you can and do the creative stuff later in post. So after you have the Kelvin adjusted um, and you need to fine tune it a little bit beyond that, you can always hit the uh, set button here and then use the down arrow button for adjust. And let's say you're in a situation where, let's say this is being lit by fluorescent light bulbs. Don't worry, I'm gonna actually show you some real life examples towards the end here. Um, what I'm gonna do is actually just down arrow a couple away from green into magenta and that'll subtract some of that greenness out of the image that you might use from, let's say fluorescent bulbs or LED bulbs. Because basically those have, I'm not any sort of, you know, ener high energy efficient light bulb expert, but basically from what I understand is that you have a really tall green spike, whereas like a traditional incandescent light bulb has equal energy across the whole entire spectrum. Whereas the LEDs and fluorescents have a big tall green spike and sometimes that green spike can uh, create a green color cast. And that's what you kind of, you're wanting to look out for. Um, so just by subtracting those and then hitting the set button, you will have eliminated or pulled out some of that greenness out of the image. All right, last up, I wanna talk about these four right here. These are our custom white balance. It's great that we have four because Canon only gave us one coming from the Canon background, um, which is great because let's say you have a studio situation, you're using exact same lights every single time. Well, you can set it just that first time. Next time you go down to your studio, boom, just set it to one and you're ready to go, which is great. To have four different ones. So basically what you're going to need for this is something either white or a gray, a neutral gray. And this thing's great. I actually have this listed on my gear page because you can have this in your pocket. Let's say you're doing a shoot, put it in your pocket, back pocket or whatever. And when you're ready, you can do this. Now, like I said before, going back to these, these presets are very fast. You can select these really quick. And then I said, when we get to here, uh, adjusting the Kelvin, this can take some time to adjust this this way or in terms of adjusting it this way. Those two adjustments, like I said, you're looking down, you're looking up, you're looking down, you're adjusting, you're tweaking, all that stuff just takes some time. This step might actually be faster, even though you have to go to your camera bag or reach in your back pocket and give this to your talent, let's say, um, and there's in front of the, the camera, this might actually take less time because you're basically, you'll put this into the frame. You wanna fill the box. I'm gonna demonstrate here in a second with either the white or the gray. Now, on the Canon side of things, they actually recommended the gray. Um, Panasonic really doesn't recommend. They actually, actually talk about using a white piece of paper, which I wouldn't advise, because usually what they do to make white paper look just a little bit whiter is they add a little blue into the pigment of the paper or whatever, and it can definitely not give you the greatest skin tones in terms of the white balance. So using this custom white balance would be a situation where you're like doing an interview or something like that. You have a controlled setting and you want to, you know, just nail the white balance right off the bat. Um, so having one of these type of things um, is a fantastic tool. And I'll show you some other tools that I've got here as well. So let's go ahead and adjust the white balance. White balance button, we'll go to let's say number one, for instance. Now what you want to do is hold it directly to the camera. I find my, I get my best results holding it on axis to the camera, not to the light, but to the camera itself. 
So let's go ahead and put it into the scene. And you're gonna notice it's like, like whoa, things are really dark. And it won't do white balance if you don't have the proper exposure. You can be off by a stop or so, maybe a stop and a half or so, but you don't wanna be more than two stops under over um, or you won't get a very good white balance. So what we're gonna do is adjust the exposure. And now you can see on my meter, it actually says zero for the light meter. So it says, hey, you got a really good exposure. You're gonna say, hey, Dave looks way out of focus. Well, it, it doesn't matter. You'll still get <laughs> great, um, great stuff going on here, even with that. Now, if you put it to the white, you'll see that I'm like almost two stops over. But a lot of times, like I said before, I get really good results using the gray. And so what I'm gonna do now is just hit the white balance button. Now I'm gonna hit the up arrow button this time, up arrow cursor. And all I have to do is get that gray into that rectangular box in the center. I have to fill that basically with either gray or white. Now you don't wanna be overexposing on the white because if there's no detail there, there's nothing for it to grab onto and give it information. So that's another reason I like using gray. So I just hit the set button, it'll take a picture and you're done. It's just that easy. So what's great about this is remember when we were in uh, the Kelvin, not only did custom white balance set the relationship between green and magenta, like here, but it also did the relationship between amber and blue. It did it all in one shot, boom, just that fast. And what I would recommend to you guys, it, it depends on your talent, the skin tones or whatever, I would try doing it for both white and gray and look at it on screen and get a determination of which one you like better. For me, I like this just a little bit better. One of my favorite tools that I've got is this big thing right here. And I'm glad I got it big because if your talent is far away from the camera and you need to fill that area, you need something large. And the reason I like this, this one's called a digital calibration target. Again, it's something I've listed on my gear page. It has black, it has middle gray, and it has white, all in one scene. And I sometimes will set the white balance, like I said, to this area or to this area, or I might even do a combination. Usually it's all that matters is if there's something neutral and it doesn't have anything, you know, of color in it, either it's black or white or some gray. There's just no color information at all. And it usually gets a good white balance. But the reason I like using this is later in the post, if I put this kind of like towards the camera, um, I can use my RGB parade scopes. And what's interesting about white balance is you might set it for, let's say, middle gray, and you might get really accurate um, grays like in the skin tones, but sometimes the whites can be off, like the highlights, like where things are really bright. Um, these might, there might be like a blue shift. Or likewise, in the darks, there might be like a slight uh, reddish push in the reds. So having all three, you can correct not only for the brights, you can go into your RG parades and correct for the mids, and you can go and correct for the darks as well. So this is a fantastic tool, and plus it has a reflector on the other side. Um, so you can use it for other things besides just, you know, getting white balance set correctly. I have two other things that I carry with me a lot, and one of them is this uh, DSC Laboratories One Shot. Um, it has very accurate um, uh, skin skin tones. We got our black, gray, and white like we did before. But then it's also got these colors that are in, like if you look at a vector scope, you can get these colors to line up in the vector scope quite well. Um, this is fantastic. And also on the back, it's got large white and gray as well. This is very small, so it's not gonna really fill, fill your frame. You can get other ones that are much larger, but cost a lot more. They're like one I had tested was like close to $300 and this one was like $99. So that's smaller. As long as you're not interfering with the light in the scene and you can get it this fairly close to this to the camera or you can zoom in on it and still have the same amount, the type of light that you've got in. Cause you, what you don't want to have happen is you getting into the scene, putting it in the scene and you're blocking one of the lights with your body. You don't want to do that. Um, but this is a very powerful tool, especially if you're like using DaVinci Resolve. And about the only thing I'll say here is um, if you use the hue versus hue control in DaVinci Resolve, you can get the these into each one of their designated graticles, if that's the correct word, on a vector scope. Um, so this can be a very powerful tool in terms of getting your colors just like spot on. And it's great for matching cameras. Like I'm shooting with the A7S and the GH4, 
just because they have different sensors, just look different. Um, so this type of device is great in terms of matching colors on two different cameras. So when you're in mixed lighting situation, it just can be very difficult. And I think the, the key thing to think about is what the subject is of the frame. Let me give you an example. So here I was actually on the plane and I noticed there was some a great difference between the light that was coming outside the plane's windows, which is very blue, to the more warm or yellowish kind of light that was coming in off the ceiling. So what, am, what is the subject here? It's basically kind of the people or the woman's face right here that I'm trying to get correct. So in this case, I chose the daylight um, instead of like tungsten, which might have made the ceiling look correct. I was wanting the, the light that was hitting her face mostly to be correct. All right, here we have the opposite situation in terms of mixed lighting. Uh, we have the lights indoors are actually lighting the people quite a bit. But the way I looked at it, I was like, you know, it looks way too amber to me. So what I did is I took a little bit of the amber out and I added some blue in. And as you can see here, I think it looks a little more correct. You can see the colors in the shirt, the colors in the newspaper looked a little bit better. But I noticed that on the wall next to the door, it looked a little bit slightly green. So I added a little magenta to here, and this is where I ended up as my final white balance. Sometimes you just kind of have to play around with it. So here is before, and here is the after in terms of white balance. So it's really important to spend that extra time, and like I said, white balance is gonna be one of those things you spend the most time on, um, to get it right as much as you can in camera, because again, we're not shooting raw, we're shooting more like JPEG. Now here's a situation where the space shuttle is being underlit by tungsten lighting, and those satellites in the background are lit by daylight mostly, because there's windows up above in this hangar. So in this situation, I was looking at the frame, I was like, you know, it looks way too orangey or too yellowish. Um, I don't want it to look that way. So what I did is I went to the tungsten setting, and as you can see now, the underneath of the space shuttle, all that black, those tiles look correct. They look balanced, and the white of the space shuttle looks balanced as well. And I, at this point, I really didn't care how the satellites looked, because again, it's one of those things of, what is the subject in your frame? Is it the space shuttle or is it the satellites? And it's, you're gonna be faced with that all the time. What is, what is your subject? And whatever that is, is if you have an opportunity to put a gray card in that particular pocket of lighting is the best way to go. Or in this case, I knew that those under lights of the space shuttle were tungsten, so I just quickly went to the tungsten preset and boom, the colors were right on for the space shuttle, whereas the, the satellites were a bit on the bluer side. Next up, I'm gonna show you some different examples. This is daylight, and right now we're on auto, auto white balance. Now we're in daylight for the correct daylight situation. But I wanna show you what it looks like with each one in different situations. So here's cloudy, and you can see it got a bit warmer. And then when we move on to shade, you can see it gets even warmer. And then when we go to incandescent, or like I've been referring to as tungsten, it gets much, much bluer. And you can see all the grass, everything kind of left. The colors are just not accurate there. All right, next up, we're on auto white balance, and this is a very cloudy day. So now we're going to work our way over to daylight. And now we're gonna work our way to cloudy, which to me looks a little bit too warm. And then we're gonna go to shade, and then it looks even too, <laughs> too, too warm. And then we're gonna go into tungsten, or incandescent and it looks way too cold. So if we go back to auto, auto looks pretty darn good and daylight to me actually probably looks the best. I'm not sure why in this situation where cloudy, like we're showing here, to me just looks a bit too warm because the grass, the grass just didn't look that color when I was there. It, this looks a little bit too warm. All right, let's run through a few more. This is kind of an evening shot. The sun's almost down. Here we are on auto. Again, auto looks pretty darn good. Here's daylight. It got a little bit cooler for some reason. And here's cloudy. I kind of like cloudy because, you know, in the evening you want it to be kind of warm looking. And here's shade, uh, perhaps too warm. And those trees are looking maybe a little too green. And then of course tungsten, if that's the look you're going for, um, if you're trying to give a very cold image, maybe it temperature wise, it's very cold up in the mountains and you want to convey that, you could definitely go to tungsten. 
Next up is a mostly a shaded area and we've got it on auto. And you can look at the, the rocks that are underneath the water on the right that are kind of amberish and versus the rocks on the lower left that are kind of blue. Here's daylight. Um, kind of took some of that color out and I almost like the auto a little bit better than the daylight. And then let's move on to cloudy. It warms up those rocks on the right hand side nicely. And here's shade. And in this case, I think shade works really well. And just for the heck of it, there is tungsten or our incandescent. So that's pretty much it for white balance. Um, these things are great. They're fantastic tools, especially if you're a beginner, because we can use this for not only for exposure, but for focus as well as white balance, because remember we could put it that rectangular part in here for both white and gray. Um, fantastic little tool. It holds up, like I said before, just have it in your pocket as you're shooting different scenes. Um, if you've got the time, if you're shooting that kind of like, like a short documentary or a uh, short film, I would say this is definitely the way to go because in post it'll just make your life so much easier. It's like I know exactly what neutral gray is and I can touch it with my eyedropper or however you want to do it. Because a lot of times when you start first starting out, the exposure looks good, um, but something else just looks off in the image. And a lot of times it just has to do with the colors. It just, the colors are just not right because you chose the wrong preset or whatever. Um, and that's that's a common mistake. It's a mistake I run into a lot. You'll look at the image like, oh, it just looks in a drab or boring. Or a lot of times, all you have to do is just do some um, post processing to it in terms of color, and all of a sudden the colors pop, things come alive, and everything looks really good again. So that's pretty much it for white balance. It's again, like I said before, probably the most time-consuming process. But if you do have a little extra time to work on it, um, it'll help your job a lot easier in post.